started then. Uh, thanks everybody for coming. Lots of familiar faces. Today we're really happy to, to uh, welcome Chris Killian from the Department of Material Science and Engineering. Uh, he's also an uh, affiliate member of our department, and as you'll see, he does things very similar to many of the things that we do. So uh, Chris began life as a chemist. We won't hold that against him. Uh, and actually worked as a, as a chemist in industry for several years. Uh, actually, over the time, he was getting his master's degree as well. So he's had a lesson, right? We can do many things simultaneously. Then went off to Australia to get a PhD. Uh, returned to the University of Chicago for a postdoc. And along the way, somewhere, he picked up uh, all this cool stuff about how materials interact with cells, which is what he's going to tell us about today. So Chris, thanks for Thank you, Michael. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, thanks for the invitation. Um, so I, I've spent most of my time since I started my faculty position around material scientists. Um, so it's great to be able to come and talk to the bioengineers because uh, my group does you know, a lot of fundamental biology. And as I'll, I'll try to, can everybody hear me? Should I scream louder? I'm testing the acoustics of the room. Um, as I'll try to show you throughout the talk, um, you know, a lot of what my lab does is it, it looks at biological systems. Um, and it's motivated by some hypotheses based on biology to then develop materials and use some of these materials-based platforms to answer some very fundamental biological questions. Um, and as uh, Michael mentioned, I'm a, um, a professor in material science, but I'm also an affiliate here in bioengineering, so I, I like being involved with bioengineering. Um, I also have an affiliation with the micro and nanotechnology lab, where I've got a stem cell lab where we do a lot of our culture and we uh, use a lot of the uh, great fabrication infrastructure there to do a lot of patterning um, and things of that nature. And I'm also involved with the, with the IGB in their uh, regenerative biology and tissue engineering team. Um, and so uh, you know, what I think we bring to the table is we are really interested in some of these, um, how we can really breathe life back into some two-dimensional assays, where um, there's um, very talented individuals on campus and, and all throughout the world that build very beautiful, complex, complex three-dimensional scaffolds. And so we, uh, we're still at the 2D level. Uh, but hopefully some of the insights that we gain we're hoping to translate into uh, three-dimensional materials for uh, next generation um, type applications. Okay, so here's a, just a, one of these uh, um, montage slides of overview of my lab. Um, we do a lot of uh, micro-patterning, um, and the reason we like micro-patterning is there's a lot of interesting things you can do when you capture a single cell or two cells or multi multiple cells in various architectures to study how they signal across junctions, how they communicate with their extracellular matrix that they're sitting on top of, and how we can control that in a rational way such that we can study the role that things like geometric cues and, uh, and actomyosin contractility play in, in guiding, ultimately, gene expression, uh, which will tell a cell what to do, whether it's going to hang out or, or, in the case of stem cells, turn into something um, that you're interested in. Um, we're also interested in nanostructured materials. Biology has a lot of nanostructure in it. So if you look at a lot of the membranes in biological systems and a lot of the hard uh, materials that are already there in biology, um, often the nanoscale presentation of, uh, of things like the mechanical environment or the presentation of ligands is crucial for uh, conveying signals to cells to tell them uh, to either migrate, to stay put, to die, to differentiate, uh, all across the board. Um, we're also interested in molecular engineering. As uh, uh, Michael uh, suggested, I am a chemist, and it's true, uh, from my early days. Um, and there's a lot of things we can do with uh, surface chemistry, utilizing platforms where we can vary the presentation of cell adhesion ligands and uh, growth factor uh, ligands to see how uh, these can signal to cells to get them to, uh, um, to perform certain functions to understand uh, how they work. Um, we're also interested in uh, hydrogel materials. And so um, this is where we start getting closer to 3D. And the reason we were interested in hydrogel, just like so many people in this department and others are, is you know, biological materials are, are comprised largely of uh, uh, polymeric architectures with biopolymers. And so understanding um, things like the elasticity of the microenvironment or, or the viscosity of these things is, is important. And so combining some of these platforms together, I feel, is really exciting because we may be able to develop models that more closely recapitulate um, the way that cells and tissues form during development. And this will help us understand uh, developmental processes as well as uh, ways that we can design new materials for applications like tissue engineering. All right, so here's a, an overview of what I'm going to show you today. 
Um, I'm going to talk about some of this work because I, I think it builds a, a nice uh, cohesive picture of how we can use these material science-based platforms to study uh, cells and cell signaling. And so we're going to explore the, the cues in the microenvironment. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about geometry, how the geometry of single cells can influence um, the cytoskeleton, which can then influence gene expression. Um, I'm going to tell you a, a new story that's emerged that I think is really exciting, and that is um, when you study these, these individual cues, um, you're, uh, we're often missing the big picture, which is that in vivo, you know, you're not just going to have a cell responding to something like stiffness or a cell responding to something like nanostructure. There's going to be an integration of these cues, and there's going to be a synergy and complementarity that arises, and we're really excited about that. Um, some of our recent work has shown that biological signaling, so paracrine and autocrine events, um, can play into some of these uh, um, pathways. And then um, finally, I'll talk a bit about some chemistry and how we can um, modulate stem cell differentiation using um, the presentation by modulating the presentation of adhesion ligands on a surface. Um, and then I'll talk about some of our, our current efforts in trying to combine these things uh, with this idea that you know if we if we can incorporate multiple cues together, we can maximize the outcome that we want and to more uh, clearly understand how cells do this naturally in vivo, as well as design new materials. Um, and then I'll, I'll tell you, you know, a bit of a different story, but using the same techniques, is uh, something that's recently come out where we found that uh, patterning may be able to be used to uh, prolong multipotency in, in stem cells and culture. And I'll show you a bit more about that. Okay, so today I'm, I'm primarily going to talk about mesenchymal stem cells. I, I imagine everybody in this room has heard of these cells. Um, I'll just, uh, so I'm not going to belabor it, uh, but these are um, an exciting cell uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, primarily um, because, you know, they're a very uh, good model system for studying uh, stem cell biology experiments, whether that's mechanical biology or differentiation type studies, uh, because they're relatively easy to work with. Um, you can get them from commercial vendors these days. And, uh, but in addition, they're, they're also still a, a, a pretty exciting candidate for regenerative therapies because of uh, this reason. They can be isolated from bone marrow as well as fat aspirates. Um, a lot of people are using these adipose-derived stem cells. And in fact, the, the literature is suggesting now that these cells may be a pericyte and reside on your vessel walls and could be present in every tissue throughout your body. And so this is uh, exciting um, for obvious reasons because these cells or closely related cells um, that we can identify with our, our marker schemes um, may be in every single tissue. And they may have slight differences, but they all uh, follow a similar set of rules to get them to regenerate uh, tissues uh, using standard homeostasis uh, processes. Um, one thing that has emerged from the use of these, uh, particularly in clinical settings, there are a number of clinical trials underway for using these, primarily for a trophic uh, response, where these cells are shown to secrete molecules that may promote angiogenesis, for instance. Um, but uh, we've been investigating these, but Really, with at the state that, that things are at right now, we have a difficult time controlling uh, the way they uh, specify and what they turn into when they differentiate. And so, really understanding the microenvironment um, better so that we can design better materials for therapy um, and things like this is, uh, is important. All right, so uh, I like to make things simple um, because these systems are incredibly complex, as I think everyone understands who studied biology. Um, so when we talk about signaling in the microenvironment, there's a number of signals that we can consider. Um, physical signals uh, is one that uh, is important. And as a material scientist, we're interested in exploring some of the physical material properties and how they influence cells. So these are things like uh, the shape of cells, the shape of tissues, how those arise, and how you may be able to manipulate cells that way. Um, the mechanical properties, so stiffness or softness of the matrix, uh, stretch, you know, we're all moving all the time and our matrices are our stretching and strain is being uh, put on various tissues, and this clearly has an influence on signaling. Um, chemical cues is my, my second area that I break things down into, and these include things like small molecules, but more importantly for the purpose of this talk is uh, the precise chemical moieties that you see in the extracellular matrix. So you know, when you have a cell sitting on top of a bed of fibronectin protein, um, there's a lot going on. It's not just that they're interacting with the protein. They're recognizing very distinct moieties in the ECM. So things like our, our friend IG, RGD peptide that uh, everybody in biomaterials is aware of. Um, but there's other synergistic ligands and other ones that haven't really been fully explored that have a function. And so we're, uh, we're also interested in exploring um, what the function of these precise ligands are. And I think there's a lot of room for discovery in this because there's so many integrated ligands on the surface of the cell and so many different ECM proteins. Um, 
And then uh, the, one, the area that's probably been studied the most is biological signaling, as I call it. And so I put into this little bucket things like paracrine and autocrine signaling, growth factors, hormones, et cetera, as well as uh, signaling across ju um, junctions, so coherent junctions and gap junctions, and how this might influence cell fate. And really, the, the theme, I think, that's coming out in the field, and you hear more and more about this, uh, this integration of these cues and trying to understand how they, how they play into one another, I think is really important. Because clearly, things like shape and stiffness is going to influence the presentation of the adhesion ligands that a cell responds to. And evidence, some of which I'll show you today, suggests that these things can lead to differential signaling of uh, biological factors. OK, so we'll talk about physical cues first. Um, and so um, there's a lot of things that have been done and a lot of studies that I think are important for exploring this space. Um, nanostructured surfaces, clearly I mentioned that uh, a lot of biology is nanostructured, but a lot of uh, these techniques we may be able to use to make new tissue engineering scaffolds, for instance, that have this component. Um, in this example here, these are titanium oxide nanotubes that uh, are grown in different sizes. And I know it's probably tough to see back there, um, but essentially, when they put mesenchymal stem cells on these surfaces, they found that cells adherent to these small nanotubes were able to spread out, get a high degree of skeletal tension, and, um, and a lot of a robust uh, uh, focal adhesion formation throughout the cell, uh, compared to cells that are adherent on these large nanotubes, where they remain rather spindly, um, and they don't uh, adopt a, uh, a, um, a stable cytoskeletal configuration. And then after several weeks, uh, when they went in and stained for markers associated with bone cell differentiation, they found that cells that were spread out had this healthy, well-developed cytoskeleton uh, expressed higher levels of uh, differentiation markers for bone. Um, similarly, you can uh, do similar studies with strain. And so here's uh, showing some mesenchymal stem cells that are being stretched on a uh, polymeric substrate. And uh, um, by doing this, you can see a differential regulation of genes associated with different differentiation outcomes. So here we have alkaline phosphatase activity in cells that were stretched for a period of time, have higher levels of bone cell differentiation, while, um, and that's true for s several other markers, <clears throat> while they see a decrease in genes associated with fat. And so what a lot of these studies are pointing to is that cytoskeletal tension appears to be something that's important for bone cell um, differentiation. Um, a, a real seminal work uh, came out of uh, Dennis Disher's lab at Penn with Adam Angler as the first author, who's now at the University of California, San Diego. And visited us last year, I think. Um, Adam and, uh, and Dennis uh, published this paper in 2006 that I think really changed the way a lot of uh, the material scientists in, uh, in bioengineering thought about these things. What they did is they did a simple experiment by varying the uh, um, stiffness of polyacrylamide gels, so standard gels used for running protein gels, from very soft uh, uh, gels that approximated the stiffness of brain tissue, so less than one kilopascal. And then they increased the cross-linking density of those gels to make them more rigid, uh, to approximate that of muscle tissue and bone tissue. And they made a really startling observation, um, but which I think makes a lot of sense, in that as you change the mechanical properties of the matrix of which these stem cells are sitting, um, you change the way that they differentiate. So here you see cells on this soft matrix are expressing markers associated with neurons. They're developing neuronal-like phenotypes, too, by extending out processes. Um, on the intermediate stiffness gels, you see muscle markers. And finally, on the stiff gels, uh, where the cells are very spread, they have high cytoskeletal tension again, and they start expressing bone markers. So I think it's a, a really exciting demonstration of uh, you know, the importance of biomaterials um, in uh, stem cell fate decisions. Another important uh, story that will play into some of the work I'm going to show you today is uh, this work that came out of Chris Chen's lab, also at Penn, um, where they um, explain something that had been observed with uh, some of the early reports of mesenchymal stem cells. Basically, um, when they first started calling these mesenchymal stem cells, they showed that if you see them at low density on tissue culture plastic, and then you see them at high density on tissue culture plastic, the cells that were uh, initially seeded at low density after several weeks showed a much higher degree of bone cell differentiation. And um, no one was really clear why that was. I think a lot of the uh, initial arguments was that clearly there's a paracrine signaling mechanism biological signals are diffusing across the dish. Uh, but what uh, uh, Chris Chen and, um, and now others have done is they uh, use uh, micro-patterning to culture cells in either small islands where they remain as big balls just sitting on the surface with very low cytoskeletal tension, or they put them on these large micro-islands that they pattern on glass uh, such that they can spread out and get a high degree of cytoskeletal tension. And uh, then they mixed 
two medias together, one that promotes fat and one that promotes bone. And um, after about a week in culture, they stain them for lipid droplets, um, which are shown in red. And they show that cells in these small islands almost exclusively turn into fat, while cells in these large islands that uh, are well spread almost exclusively turn into bone. Um, and so clearly, um, the spreading of these cells is important for differentiation. And it makes sense in terms of other observations that have been made with other material systems that show that um, you know, when a cell is very well spread on a nanostructured surface or on a stiff matrix, um, and they, that uh, they prefer to differentiate to bone than if they're balled up or rather spindly. Um, they went and did some really nice, elegant work to show that uh, this uh, involved um, some signaling and pathways uh, uh, that uh, utilized uh, feedback loop between uh, rho, um, <coughs> this rho A, small GTPase, as well as rho kinase, and that in the absence of uh, high levels of rho A, cells would prefer to go turn into fat. Okay, um, and so um, I think another exciting thing about patterning that we can do, outside of the spreading thing, is we can explore other geometric cues that can influence these cells. And this is a, a picture that I really like that came out of a review from Manuel Therry um, in 2010. Um, and he showed, he, he basically explained how by micro-patterning cells, you can recapitulate some of the aspects of the native microenvironment, whether that's geometry, architecture, you know, so connection with other cells, composition, mechanics, dynamics, etc. And so this is an uh, immunofluorescence image of some mesenchymal stem cells on plastic. Just about everybody uses plastic, including us, um, for culturing cells, but it in no way reflects what a cell sees in the body, right? I mean, you have this rigid gigapascal uh, synthetic material of a sea of nutrients sitting above the cells. And so with micropatterning, we can at least start breaking apart some of these things. And so here's a picture of cells that have been micropatterned in our lab um, in a, a range of different geometries. And the reason we do this is now instead of just changing area, we manipulate some of the subcellular curvatures and aspect ratios and things like that. And we can get very different organization of the filaments within the cell. So this is a flower shape. And you see here we got the nuclei in the center and we get this nice ring-like uh, filamentous actin network, and uh, it's just this beautiful web uh, formation of uh, microtubules throughout the cell. And by modulating that architecture, changing it up, using different shapes, you can influence the way that these things align and, uh, and, uh, and use this as a method to study the importance of, uh, of geometry and how it uh, influences uh, the cytoskeletal architecture. Um, and so the platform we use to do this is microcontact printing on thin layers of gold. We like gold because it's such a well-developed uh, chemistry for self-assembled monolayers. Um, and so in essence, we make a PDMS stamp, so just a regular uh, silicone rubber stamp. We can ink that with a chemistry of choice. In this case, we use this octadecane thiol molecule, which can chemisorb to the gold surface and form a very stable uh, gold uh, sulfur bond. Um, and then by patterning that, we can then backfill the remaining regions outside with a um, a non-adherent oligoethylene glycol moiety, which will prevent uh, protein adsorption and cell adhesion. We can then physisorb to the surface of these hydrophobic regions some protein of interest. Uh, we usually use fiber nectin, but we've also looked at laminins, collagens. Um, and then, because we have these ethylene glycol regions, we can capture cells specifically on the uh, islands that we stamped. And so we can do this uh, across a range of geometries. It's some work uh, um, that I helped out with during my postdoc, where we looked at uh, um, motility features and contractility features using just a, a wide array of different geometries to see how you could influence, uh, um, and these are with cancer cells, um, the migratory features of these adherent cancer cells by changing um, some of the uh, geometric cues. And so the question we're asking is, can we utilize some of these to look at the influence that some of these uh, more subtle cues have on differentiation? And so the first thing that we looked at was aspect ratio. And so using a similar protocol to what Chris Chen had uh, in uh, their 2004 uh, work, we just took two bottles of media and mixed them one to one. One would promote fat, one would promote bone. Um, and when you do that on plastic, you get this crazy heterogeneous mixture of cells. You have little pockets where you got a lot of fat, a lot of bone in some regions. And it's quite variable. Um, when you pattern the cells, um, you can just go across the uh, surface and count cells that either express bone markers fat markers for both, and tend, there tend to be a small amount that presents both, usually less than uh, 5%. Um, and so when we did this with uh, rectangles of the same area, but with increasing aspect ratio from 1 to 1, uh, 3 to 2, and 4 to 1, 
Um, and we counted the cells, we see an interesting trend that emerged, where that as we increase aspect ratio, we increase, increase the proportion of cells in the culture that are turning into bone cells. And so we see uh, in, this, in the square, we see about equal numbers of fat and bone cells, but as we go to this uh, longer rectangle, we see more bone. And so we went to explore why this was, and uh, one of the things that really stood out was as you increase aspect ratio, while keeping area constant, so there's no difference in spreading here, uh, we see um, uh, an increase in cytoskeletal tension, where now we get very large stress fibers along the long edge of the cell with more focal adhesions on the short end. And so similar to the spreading, we have an increase in actomyosin contractility in these geometries, which seems to be uh, a cue to promote bone cell fate. Uh, similarly, we uh, did the same thing with uh, uh, a five-fold symmetric geometry where we have uh, a flower-shaped cell. And uh, where we have here is these convex regions of curvature on the perimeter. Um, and then a, a simple pentagon and then the star-shaped geometry. And so looking under a microscope, at first they all look the same. And so this was really startling when we first made this observation. Um, and so when you, go, when you expose them to the differentiation conditions, we find that Going from this flower to a star shape, you see almost a complete lineage shift, where now on the star we see most cells are differentiating uh, to bone cells. And consistent with uh, the spreading and with uh, the aspect ratio, when we do immunostaining for actin and vinculin for focal adhesions, we see that cells in star geometry have a, a much uh, higher degree of uh, these bundle-like stress fibers between the points of the star. And the reason is that there's these non-adhesive spaces between these points where the cell has to overlap. And this is a cue to generate a lot of stress in the cells. And so they develop these strong stress fibers that are then anchored by very large focal adhesions, sometimes on the order of tens of microns, uh, right on the, on the tips of the cell. Um, one thing that's really terrific about doing these patterned cultures is when you have unpatterned cells, yeah, they're all over the place. Every cell has a different shape. It's, uh, it's really tough to, um, to make any morphological conclusions about them. Um, but when you do patterning, you're constraining every cell in the same geometry, so you can do cool things like make heat maps. And so what these are is uh, we took 80 and 86 images of single cells that were stained for myosin 2A, and then overlaid them in ImageJ, a program you get from the NIH, and then you can generate an average immunofluorescence heat map, um, and which can give you somewhat of a, a semi-quantitative indication of a feature. And in this case, it's contractility, where we're looking at uh, myosin 2. And you see that cells in this flower geometry have a diffuse myosin staining all across the cell, while in the star geometry you see um, a very high localization of myosin uh, between the points of the star, um, which is consistent with this idea that it's in a more of a contractile phenotype. Um, so we uh, thought this was pretty cool, so we uh, went to try to figure out what was causing some of this and, and whether we could attribute this directly to cytoskeletal tension. So we used some pharmacological inhibition studies and so um, here's our control condition, where you get fat on the flowers and bone on the stars. When you treat these cultures with nicotazole, which inhibits microtubules and can lead to a high degree of cytoskeletal tension in the cells, um, but using a concentration where the cells remain viable and they stick to the shapes, uh, we see that we get abrogation of this trend, where now all of the cells are turning into bone. And so we've, we've lost the shape dependence by um, basically using a sledgehammer to knock the uh, contractility off of these cells. Um, and in contrast, you can do it with, uh, with other molecules. So we inhibited myosin, a light chain with bolivastatin. And there we saw the same trend, but this time we see all of the cells turn into fat. And by blocking growth kinase, which is a, an important uh, player in um, the contractility of cells, um, we also saw abrogation of this trend in all fat. So this is consistent with, uh, with our story, that um, these subtle geometric cues can influence actomyosin contractility. And by knocking it out, we can get rid of the shape direct. Okay, um, one of the things that came out that was somewhat surprising from this is, um, and this happens when you run microarray experiments, um, anyone who's done that will know this, you just get a big old barrel full of data and you have to spend a lot of time digging through. Um, and so, you know, I spent several months uh, staring at microarray data and there are a lot of pathways that seem to be uh, differentially modulated by, uh, by shape. Um, but uh, one thing that really stood out that I thought was interesting is cells in the star geometry had a uh, high expression of uh, these wingless type uh, soluble proteins that are secreted. And they're involved in all sorts of stages of development as well as cancer and bone cell formation. Um, and we also saw um, increased expression of a lot of the mitogen activated protein kinase pathways that are involved in mechanotransduction, like the, um, like the extracellular related kinases and the C-June internal kinases. Um, so we were curious about what role they played in this uh, shape-direct effect. And at the time, you know, it wasn't so clear 
um, how, how these, you know, these mechanochemical pathways influenced uh, the lineage uh, programs. So we wanted to try to figure out if we can get a direct link uh, to gene expression. And so we, uh, we inhibited WINTS extracellularly using uh, in just small uh, protein molecules that inhibit uh, uh, WINTS signaling. So DKK1, which inhibits the canonical WINTS at the membrane. And when we add DKK1, we see a slight increase in adipogenesis and decrease in osteogenesis. Not very significant, though. Um, when we add a secreted frizzle-related protein, which will block all WINTS in solution as well as at the membrane, uh, we see uh, a bigger increase in adipogenesis. And then when we mix those two, we see uh, pretty much uh, we lose all of our shape-directed differentiation, suggesting that uh, with this contractility, the WINTs are really playing a serious role. And, um, and so the, you know, the picture that I, I paint with this is that um, when you have a contractile cell and a cell that is not as contractile, um, the contractile cell upregulates a lot of the players that are involved in WINT signaling, so the small GTPases, the rho kinase, and some of these pathways, because there's a convergence between many of these, uh, these um, signal transduction pathways. So WINT signaling to the membrane, where it reacts, reacts with these frizzle receptors, will lead to an increase and an activation of, uh, of rho kinase and some of the MAP kinases. And so we feel these pathways are working together to enhance this shape-directed differentiation. Okay? So, you know, this, we thought this was really interesting, and so how can we utilize micropatterning to um, explore this further? And so we went back to um, this, this argument that the spreading of the cell influences osteogenesis. And I think a lot of biologists, um, and many I'd spoken with felt this way, um, still believe that paracrine signaling is, is very important and is, is likely to play a significant role um, in these, uh, these different density cultures. And so to remind you, at low density seeding, you get a high degree of osteogenesis, shown here with the, the blue. Well, in, when you initially see it at high density, you get a low degree of osteogenesis. And Chris Chen um, and others suggested this was because of um, this mechanical aspect of, of uh, spreading. Um, so we wanted to look at paracrine signaling. And so the way we devised to do this, very simply, is by patterning cells at a different distance. So you can um, reduce the, uh, the diffusional path length between the, the single cells. And so going from about 100 microns separating out every cell to 200 to 400 to 800, so they're nearly a millimeter apart in your dish. Um, and so we, we did the analysis that way, and we dumped in the chemicals as before, and uh, something really startling came out of this, where at very high density, we see most of the cells are turning into fat. But as we increase the spacing between them, we see an enrichment in cells that are differentiating to bone. And so this, uh, you know, my jaw absolutely dropped on this because it was unexpected where we see um, at high density a lot of fat, but as you um, um, decrease the density, you get almost a complete switch here, where now um, most of your cells that are very far spaced apart are expressing bone cell markers. So clearly something's going on here. We're, we're still struggling with what it is, but I'll tell you about some of the, some of the candidates. Um, so the first obvious thing to do, change the media. If there's some secreted factor that's being shot out from cells to their neighbors, if you take that media out, you'll influence whether or not the cells are seeing that. So, we change the media every 12 hours for a week. Um, it was an interesting week. Um, and, um, and what we see is uh, you know, what we would hopefully expect to see, where um, here's our control condition where we see a decrease in fat as the spacing increases and an increase in bone. When you change the media every 12 hours, you now see more bone on every single um, shape. Um, the problem with this experiment, of course, is that you're adding new osteogenic components in there, and there's a lot of other variables that could play a role. So it doesn't demonstrate completely um, um, uh, solving this issue. Um, so we played around some more. Um, the next thing, of course, is take media from these high-density cultures. So we, we cultured cells at high density and took that conditioned media and fed it back. And uh, we see a slight change in uh, differentiation. So here's adding 1x media. So 1x is 100 microns of heart cells to so 2x, 4x, and 8x space cells. And we see a slight increase in fat and decrease in bone although it's not statistically significant, but maybe suggestive. Um, and then uh, we further took that media and uh, ran some gels to see if we could isolate species. And uh, actually spent quite a bit of time trying to fractionate the media to determine what could be causing this density effect, and, which isn't much fun. It takes a lot of time, actually. It's very messy, particularly when you've got things like um, the bovine serum albumin in your cell culture media, and you're trying to deplete that out and just mass this whole region up here your uh, gel. Um, but we did see some uh, interesting candidate species over here in the 30 to 40 kill Dalton range, and they're interesting because of our microarray analysis again, where we saw that cells that were patterned 
um, had a very high expression of these secreted frizzle-related proteins, which are um, Wnt inhibitors. And um, so we saw greater than tenfold expression compared to a non-patterned surface with um, cells in these conditions. Um, and so we did some Western analysis of our gels, and they're present, and they increase over time. So these MSCs are secreting uh, this uh, Wnt inhibitory molecule over time. Um, so then uh, what we did is we purchased some antibodies to block the secreted chrysal related proteins in these cultures. And what we saw is that here's our control again, more fat on the 1x that decreases as you increase the spacing. If you block uh, secreted chrysal related protein 2 that we saw a high expression of, um, no real change, maybe some slight change, but nothing, nothing significant. Um, 5, nothing significant. But then here, with the secreted frizzle related protein 3, when you block those in culture, um, we see you know, partial abrogation of this, uh, this density dependence. So right now, um, this is one of our, our top candidates for a molecule that may mediate this paracrine signaling effect. Um, because here, when we block the secreted frizzle related protein 3, uh, we see that pretty much all of our, um, our cultures, whether they're 1x, 2x, 4x, or 8x, separated on the surface are turning into bone. So we thought that's pretty exciting. Um, we also supplemented that uh, result by adding um, recombinant SFRP3. And this wasn't too surprising of a result because we had seen this with our, our previous work, where when you add this protein, it promotes uh, fat cell differentiation. Um, and so in our control condition, again, we see this trend. When you add recombinant SFRP3, um, you get rid of the trend. Although you still see something going on here when the cells are really uh, far apart. And so there's likely other factors that play a role here, but this is uh, absolutely a candidate. And I think it, it demonstrates how, um, if you think outside of the box with some of these conventional you know, micropatterning technologies, you can, uh, you can do some really cool fundamental science. All right. Um, so I'm going to tell you now about uh, a chemistry story, um, about how we can uh, explore um, how uh, ligands on a surface can influence uh, stem cell fate. First, I'm going to drink a water. And so the hypothesis here was similar to the nanostructured surfaces, stiff matrices. Uh, geometry. Um, we could utilize ligands that have an enhanced affinity for integrin receptors to, uh, to change the uh, cytoskeletal tension of the cell and therefore influence differentiation. And so to do that, um, we used our self-assembled monolayer chemistry, but this time um, using this malamide functionalized monomer that we mixed into the, to the SAM, and then we immobilized a thiolated peptide uh, one which uh, has the RGD peptide, shown here in red, um, which is the linear peptide that's utilized in most uh, biomaterials um, proof of principle studies. Um, but we also use the cyclic analog that had been explored for years as a, as a therapeutic candidate. And um, it's, it's interesting because the difference between these is really just the confirmation. And, and what this does is it's really a, a, a thermodynamics argument. And so when the, cell, when the uh, peptide is in this vent confirmation, it'll slide right into the integrin pocket into the binding pocket. Well, if it's uh, this linear peptide, the protein has to do the work and fold it over. And so because of this, you get um, higher focal adhesion turnover as the cells are grabbing onto these cyclic peptides. You tend to get more focal adhesions throughout the cell and greater spread. And so we thought, if you get more focal adhesions, you get better spreading, maybe we'll get more bone cell differentiation. And so we used uh, an array of gold islands for this, where each one has been uh, modified with different peptides so we can control within the same experiment. And this is a phenotype of these cells on linear peptide, where you see you know, they're well spread, they've got lots of focal adhesions on the side. But when they're on the cyclic peptide or on fibronectin, uh, which has a loop domain where the RGD is, so it's already in that bent shape, right? Um, we see uh, lots of focal adhesions and many more than the linear case, and, and in particular on the interior of the cell. And they tend to be larger in area, have more cytoskeletal tension, etc. And so um, in our first experiments, thankfully, we decided not to add a bunch of media. We just let them grow, and then we fixed and stained them. And uh, you know, we got some really interesting results. So here we see our control, where with these heterogeneous populations of MSCs, anyone who works with MSCs has seen this, um, you always get uh, a mixture of cells, where some of them express alkaline phosphatase. And this is uh, likely due to you know, the heterogeneous nature of the culture, but also probably because some of these cells are becoming transit amplifying cells moving more towards osteoblasts. And so um, uh, we always get a mixture of these. But when you culture them on fibronectin for 10 days, we see that more of them are expressing alkaline phosphatase. When we compare the two peptide surfaces, both at high density, 1% of the surface has the peptide, or low density, 0.1%. 
On the cyclic peptides, we see a higher degree of alkaline phosphatase staining compared to the linear peptide. And that can be shown here, um, where uh, we see for fibronectin in the high density cyclic, the highest uh, percentage of cells expressing alkaline phosphatase, which then drops off as you go to lower density and the linear peptide. Um, so this seems to suggest that perhaps the um, spacing and the uh, affinity of the ligand for the receptor can influence the, the fate decisions. So we did some other staining. Um, this is uh, for RUNX2, which is a master osteoblast regulator. And uh, we see a peak in the RUNX2 expression. And this is normalized nuclear to cytoplasmic fluorescence. And we see that uh, for cells on the cyclic peptide and the fibronectin, we see higher uh, nuclear expression of RUNX2, indicating that you have uh, more of a proportion of lineage active uh, um, um, RUNX2. Um, so we also isolate RNA from this to verify our amino fluorescence results. Um, and so we uh, treated, uh, we um, got RNA and we uh, profiled these and found that uh, we got the same sort of trend. We're here for alkaline phosphatase. We see uh, robust expression on uh, cells on fibronectin, on cyclic peptide, but then a significant decrease um, in expression on the linear peptide. And uh, a similar sort of trend we saw for, for RUNX2. Um, and one of the things that was interesting with these experiments, and I started thinking about when I was actually considering um, some of Adam Engler and Dennis Tischer's work is the morphological changes that occur on these different materials. And if you put cells on gels, you'll, you'll see you know, as the cells can uh, exert tractional forces differentially on these different materials. Um, um, you can understand, and, and you see a similar thing here when you change the density of ligand. We're here on the uh, cyclic peptides. Most of the cells have more of a cuboidal shape, um, very symmetric. But as you go to lower density um, cyclic peptide and the high density of the linear, you start to see elongation, where cells are, are getting more elongated. Um, they're taking on different shapes. And then finally, at this very low density peptide uh, surface, many cells start to look a little neuroned. And I'm not going to claim that these are neurons, but similar to what uh, you know, Adam Engler had shown, these processes being extended was a, a, one of the hallmark characteristics. And so um, now I should point out, too, uh, when we quantitated these shape changes, um, the low density is really interesting where we see that after 10 days in culture, we see uh, a significant decrease in um, cell area as well as nuclear area. And when, when I see a change in nuclear area, that tells me something's going on with gene expression, and maybe the chromatin is condensing, um, and some other program is going on. So uh, we stain these for all sorts of markers. Um, the, the result, uh, I'll just give you the punchline, was that on um, the, high, on the uh, cyclic peptides, these cells would always tend to prefer to express markers associated with bone cell differentiation, while on the high-density linear peptide, we started to see expression of markers associated with myogenesis. So remember, on the intermediate stiffness gels um, that Engler and Discher worked with, they showed expression of myogenesis. And uh, here at this uh, high density of peptide that has a lower affinity for the alpha V beta 3 integrin, we started to see expression of muscle markers. And then these cells that were extending out all these processes on the low density, a good fraction of them were uh, expressing beta 3 tubulin, which is a marker for neurogenesis. So uh, this is that quantitative, where here you see uh, it's not an incredible high amount, but it is significant. Um, here's the RUNX2 data showing that we get preferential bone um, marker expression, and then the MyoD on the high density linear peptide, and beta 3 tubulin on the low density linear peptide. Uh, we did RT-PCR of this as well, and we, um, we see the same sort of trends when we look at the gene expression level. Um, and so uh, we see higher expression in muscle markers and uh, neuronal markers on these linear peptides. So consider this example of uh, stiffness, where people are, have been talking about for quite a while now um, the importance of the material's elasticity and its stiffness in directing differentiation. So from this work, it suggests that in addition to stiffness, we may be able to modulate the density and the affinity of ligands on the biomaterial to get similar trends in lineage specification. And I think this is interesting uh, for a number of reasons, for a practical reason for biomaterial design. If you want to promote bone cell fate, have a high density of cyclic peptides. But also, I think it's interesting if you reflect on the nature of the microenvironment that we're working with. If you're talking about brain tissue, you're going to have a soft material. Um, the exposure of ligands for adhesion might be very different than if you have a very rigid calcified matrix, where you're going to have a, a lot more area for cells to grab onto, exert forces, and spread out. And so I think, in many ways, this result uh, reflects that. Um, in addition, one thing that uh, has become a bit of a controversy just recently um, that came out in a paper uh, just several months ago. And I was at a meeting this summer where, uh, where Adam Angler and uh, some of the people, the authors of this paper were there, and it, it got kind of heated. Uh, and 
that's exciting. It's exciting when science gets turned over and gets argumentative. And I think this has been in my mind and others for a long time, that when you cross-link polyacrylamide, which is the gel they used in this study, um, and you vary cross-linking density, um, you're not just varying stiffness, you're varying the porosity. So this is an SEM image of soft gels and stiff gels across a range of mechanical properties. And so you get very different uh, pore sizes in these materials. And if you're cross-linking your protein that the cells are going to grab onto at the surface, you I mean, look at what the cell's going to see. It's going to see a very different distribution of protein um, depending on what surface it's sitting on because of this porosity effect. Um, and so I think this is interesting in, in light of the result that we found that by varying the spacing of these RGD peptides, you can vary the differentiation outcome. Um, and so this may clearly play a role. And so this is uh, the result that they found. Um, this was a, a big collaboration that was done with Fiona Watt at Cambridge, as well as uh, Wilhelm Huck and uh, and uh, Joaquin Spates, a number of these big names. And they, they did this, uh, they published this paper where using polyacrylamide, and this time they used fat and bone. So fat is the soft tissue, bone is the stiff tissue. Um, and they found that as you increase the, uh, the stiffness, you get more cells, which is what uh, others have found. Um, but you, when, in terms of differentiation, you get a decrease in fat and an increase in bone. So this is expected, that as a, uh, um, on soft materials, you'll get more fat cell differentiation. On stiff materials, you'll get more bone cell differentiation. And so this is uh, um, consistent with this argument that uh, there's lineage matching between the differentiation outcome and the mechanics of the material. But then they went and used PDMS, uh, which doesn't have a porosity component. And they showed that um, when they modified PDMS uh, of different mechanical properties, um, that they saw no difference in the number of cells no difference in adipogenesis and no difference in osteogenesis. So here they have different uh, mechanical properties of their substrates, but the same ligand density, the same amount of immobilized protein, and they see no change. So this is a pretty controversial. There's a number of problems with the experiment, I think, uh, in terms of uh, you know, the PDMS material and what they're actually detecting, but I think it, it, uh, it's exciting, right? Because it uh, opens up new areas for discussion. Um, and in terms of this question, I, I'm sitting more here, where I think that clearly these, these things play um, different roles. So um, this was a, a paper done a couple years ago with Fu and uh, Chris Chen and Penn again, where they used these uh, elastomeric microposts arrays that they have. And what they did a really cool trick where they just changed the height of these posts. And so the, the mechanical properties of the material is the same, but they're just changing the height such that the stiffness that the cell sees is different across these. And so what they showed is here, cells on very short posts spread out, and they tend to differentiate in the bone. Cells on these long posts that are very flexible um, tend to ball up, and they turn into fat. But here, um, arguably, the adhesion ligand presentation is going to be the same across these surfaces. And so I think this is still open to debate, but I think it's, a, it's definitely an interesting area. OK? How are we doing on time? OK. Still got a few minutes. All right, so now I'm just going to show you some of the new things we're doing with uh, combining these cues. And so, as I, I mentioned at the start of my talk, um, I think you know, the, the next generation of 2D assays is going to be involved now that we've got lots of control over microstructure interfaces, surface chemistry, um, is looking at how these things play together. And shape and stiffness is one that I've been, uh, been interested in recently. And so this is the idea. We can uh, um, now vary things like shape and stiffness. We can also look at variations in ECM chemistry and stiffness and shape. And so my lab is actively looking at ways that we can develop platforms to vary these things rationally and control it. Um, and shape and stiffness, I got excited about this. Uh, um, here's a, the work by Angler and Disher again, where we see very different shapes across these different stiffness gels. Here's a neuron, myoblast, and osteoblast. But when I did these experiments, I saw a mixture of things. Um, and so I just showed you some work where they showed on soft gels you get fat cell differentiation. Um, when, I, when we've cultured uh, MSCs on these very soft gels, we see that some cells um, express beta-3 tubulin, a low percentage of them, while many cells start to accumulate lipid droplets, which appears that they're going towards an adipocyte fat cell phase. And similarly, on stiffer materials, you tend to get a mixture of cells that are expressing markers of muscle and bone. And so the question is, can we devise a way to exclusively promote these different fates on these hydrogel materials? And so one way, perhaps, is to use shape, since there's so, so very many different shapes between these cell types. And so we adapted a technique, uh, and this is work done by a student in my group, Amr Abdeen, 
Um, and this is a, a technique um, developed many years ago, actually, where polyacrylamide gels are modified with this uh, hydrazine treatment, and then you oxidize a glycoprotein to have an aldehyde that you can then immobilize to the gel. Um, and we developed a strategy to, to robustly do this across a range of stiffnesses. And uh, it was really tough to get it on the soft materials, but we are able to pattern cells. These are single musical stem cells to pattern on gels with half a kilopascal of uh, stiffness. Um, and, uh, and so we decided to see what patterning would do. Um, here's a, an example of a, a sort of an interesting uh, early development that we're currently investigating, where we found that when uh, in unpatterned culture, in patterned culture, we see very different mixtures of these lineages. So here, when cells are patterned, it's tough to see here, but that's because the marker uh, isn't really there. But these are patterned cells, and they show very low levels of beta 3 tubin. While well, in unpatterned culture, a subset of these cells will elongate, develop these, these processes, and start expressing this marker for neurons. And this is that quantitated, um, with this box and whisker plot, where we see um, throughout the spread, there are some of these cells that are expressing higher levels of beta 3 tubin. Um, maybe more interestingly, when we pattern uh, cells, and we stain them for uh, adipogenesis markers, we see that most of the cells across the surface are expressing markers associated with fat. And so I, I think this is really interesting. In, in a couple experiments, we saw greater than 90% of the pattern cells have lipid droplets. And uh, you know, the, my hand wavy argument um, is right now is that perhaps what we're doing is um, limiting some of these morphological changes that occur on these different uh, materials of different uh, stiffness. Where if a cell needs to elongate and form dendritic processes um, in order to undergo this uh, neurogenesis platform uh, pathway, um, and it's restricted by being patterned in these small shapes, perhaps it can't do that and it chooses that cell. Thing. And so perhaps this could be a platform to modulate between these different lineages. And so we're currently exploring this in other uh, systems um, to look at other differentiation outcomes like muscle and bone, and uh, perhaps finding ways that we can guide uh, neuronal um, process extension. Um, on stiffer gels, uh, this is just a snapshot of uh, some recent result from a student in my group, June, uh, June Min Lee. And uh, what June did is he, uh, he used this uh, shape that he, he calls uh, affectionately the Batman shape. He actually sent me a picture for our calendar that has like Batman standing on a tower and the light is showing this cell up there. I should have put that in the slide. Um, but uh, the idea of this geometry isn't uh, because we like Batman, it's that it, it has some of these cues that we've seen previously on gold to uh, promote bone cell differentiation. So it's got aspect ratio and it's got regions of subcellular curvature. And what June found is when he leaves cells just to sit on um, 10, 20, 30, or 40 kilopascal gels, he sees expression and then an increase at 30, just like Adam Angler and Dennis Disher did, um, where this seems to be an optimal uh, microenvironment uh, uh, mechanics to promote bone cell fate. But when cells are, are, are a pattern in this uh, this Batman geometry, you see a higher expression of, uh, of RUNX2, this, uh, uh, this regulator of osteogenesis in this geometry. And so uh, I, think, uh, I think this is a, a pretty cool result, and we're going to try to find ways that we can um, do this for myogenesis and these others in order to maximize the lineage outcome. And the idea in the long run would be able to control across a material surface differentiation spatially in the way that you want, so that you could have gradients of cells because remember, there's no chemicals added here. This is just the mechanics and the geometry of the cells. So you might be able to pattern fat and bone and integrating it with our ability to use microfluidics and some of these technologies to form gradients of stiffness. Um, you could envisage all sorts of really cool applications. All right, um, I'm pretty much done here, aren't I? I'll just go really briefly through this. Um, this is just a news story that's come up that I think is interesting, um, and it revolves around this idea that kind of came a bit out of a, a serendipitous discovery where um, we uh, patterned cells and they were left, and these chemistries on gold are not so stable. And so cells can migrate and leave them uh, after about a week. And these were left for too long, and so they migrated out. And they were fixed and stained anyway, thankfully, because we saw something really interesting where when cells, as we, we culture them normally, are allowed to express alkaline phosphatase when they divide, um, when they were patterned, after they escape, they're no longer expressing alkaline phosphatase for whatever reason. So we am um, thinking this could be related to quiescence. Um, and so we did some staining to see if these cells are synthesizing DNA. And when they're patterned, they tend to not. There are very small patterns. These cells seem to be turning into a quiescent state. Um, and then one thing that I think is really exciting that's coming out is we see that in this uh, these patterned cells were seeing higher expression of stem cell markers. And so we did these experiments where we patterned the cells um, 
And then after they escaped, we tryptonized them and then reseeded them at the same density and looked at stem cell markers. And here for endoglin and stro one, we see a higher expression of stem cell markers in cells that had been patterned. And, uh, and importantly, we see high expression of alkaline phosphatase in the unpatterned cells. So this might be a way to prolong the stem cell phenotype in culture. And so you can imagine being able to do this to maintain that. And I think it's pretty neat work. And this is work by Doug Zhang in my group. Um, and they also can still differentiate. I'll show that before I close here. And so here, this is alkaline phosphatase staining. Um, you see less differentiation, um, and that's pr presumably because many of the cells in the starting population are still mesenchymal stem cells and not progenitors. And we see this with uh, fat as well. Okay, um, I'm just going to quickly summarize uh, cell geometry and these things influence each other. This is uh, really at the heart of uh, our group's work and seeing how we can use these platforms together um, and combine these cues to maximize outcomes. And uh, in this new work, I think it's pretty exciting where we might be able to use patterning to prolong um, this MSC phenotype. With that, I'd like to thank my group. Uh, this is an uh, older picture, but we've expanded a bit. Um, in particular, I want to thank Amr, who's uh, developed a lot of the hydrogel chemistry, uh, June, who's um, done some of the, the patterning on hydrogels, and Doug with his recent story. Um, I've got to thank uh, Milan Merksish and his group, of course, for some of the preliminary work that I did during my postdoc and uh, these collaborators listed here. With that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions? So I think uh, before we can relate that directly to a lot of the work that's been done with muscle differentiation and things like that. Um, I also think that um, the techniques they used for measuring the stiffness of the materials, um, I believe they, they used AFM, some of these things, which, which are valid, but it, it would have been nice to see some, some complementary approaches. Um, and also, you know, they didn't, they didn't characterize um, as well as maybe they could have um, you know, how the cells are interacting. So, I'm, I mean, in, from a surface chemistry perspective, I'm interested in how the cells are actually grabbing onto these ligands. So I would have liked to see a more detailed analysis of full adhesions and, and traction forces and things like that. So th those types of things. I'm sure there's other people you know, on this campus that have many other issues, too. Yes? So, so other than maybe shape, if you're just looking at uh, imaging of the cells, uh, are there other sort of markers to differentiate? Excellent question. I mean, that, that's something I'd love to do. We haven't, we haven't done any of that. Most of our analysis has been static and measuring you know, large populations of cells. But, I mean, clearly, and I, I think the field's moving in that direction too. We're doing some live cell analysis. And, and you know, I started a collaboration during my postdoc with uh, Prabhas Mohi at Rutgers. And he does a lot of this high content imaging of cells. And uh, looking at things like cytoskeletal descriptors is something that I, I think would be really exciting where after a day or two you might be able to see rearrangement of the cytoskeleton and be able to make some more firm correlations between these morphological changes and outcome. I mean, it's absolutely exciting, but I haven't done any of it. Any questions? Yes. Yeah. Hydrogel chemistry is coming out all the time. Christy Hansep is one of the names that pops in where she can use like, two photon, um, two photon techniques to locally polymerize gels in a three-dimensional way. 
to be able to modulate the tissue shape in a 3D material. Um, and a lot of the control over like some of these peg-based multi-arm gels where you may be able to change the length of the pegs and, and rationally incorporate um, peptide ligands into some of these scaffolds. So synthetic scaffolds, I think, we're, we're starting to develop new cool tools. Um, whether, you know, I think we're a long ways off before we can translate those into um, something that uh, might be biologically relevant. Maybe not too far. Maybe not too far. That's my feeling. Making progress. We still, I don't think we'll be able to you know, fabricate a, you know, a scaffold that resembles what, you have, what happens when you decellularize a heart, for instance. But you know, I think we're, we're learning some of the principles. And, and these fundamental studies, I think, feed into that, where you know, we can, at least with these synthetic strategies we're developing, we know that we can um, use materials principles to vary things like stiffness and the presentation. All right, let's thank Christmas again.